you leave a business with an annual turnover of $11 billion to delve into politics. Nigerian politics for that matter. Well, my guest for this week made that decision and is here today to share his story with me. He is the co-founder and the former group executive director of Sahara Group, an energy conglomerate in Africa and other parts of the world, hosting of over 4,000 workers. He is architect Tonye Patrick Cole. He's my guest for today. Welcome to Exclusive with Kenny Ajimobi. Sit back and enjoy. childhood did you have and how has it helped to influence where you are today? You know, I, I had quite an interesting childhood in that I am unlike what most people would think that I grew up at home, parents and uh, mother, father together and all of that. My father was in school, he left during the war, uh, my mom uh, was here and then I went into uh, stay with him briefly for about a year, then came back, then ended up in Ibadan with uh, an uncle and then came back to Lagos, uh, then spent the next eight years uh, growing up uh, with an uncle and not in my parents' house before I came into my parents' house at 16. So I think that became a formative part because at the beginning it was almost like you're unsettled, you're moving from one home to another, uh, from Lagos to, uh, indeed from Patakot first of all, uh, to, to Anambra State, from Anambra State to London, from London back to Lagos, then Ibadan, then Lagos. So you had that kind of movement. And so I believe that all of that formed me because you had different parents. Uh, so a whole village raised me and I think I'm one of those children. You always um, never failed to mention the impact that your father has had in your life and in your career. If you were to explain that to us in details, what kind of influence did you have on you? Well, I <laughs> very good. I think my, my, my father in himself was somebody who, or is someone very intellectual. Um, everywhere you go, you hear almost three things that, oh, your father is a very smart man. And secondly, that he has a very good name. Uh, and third, that he's a networker. He knows a lot of people. He's a relationships person. And growing up, I saw that. I saw that with him. He was always jovial, always out, but always with something very smart to say. And so it taught me, even as I started going into business, that when I went into places, opened doors and all of that, there was never a bad thing. I never had shame on a name. And so I knew how important it is to maintain that name uh, as a legacy, even for the children. Was there anything he did in particular that made you say, or like affected positively your choice of work and career in life? Um, not necessarily. I would say when it, okay, maybe the other way around. My father allowed us choices and he was the kind that made choices something that you took even as a child. I remember at 11, uh, I'd taken to common, the common entrance and had gotten admission into two schools, Igobi and King's College. And you would think that at 10 going on to 11, that the choice of which secondary school you will go to will be left to your parents and not to you. Well, no, not in my father's case. I had to make that choice. I had to choose which one of the secondary schools I, I would go, even though I got admission into both. So he was somebody who made choices uh, and the consequence of choice is very, very clear uh, to us. So I had to take that choice. Then uh, getting into the secondary school, uh, I'd, <coughs> I'd ended up doing A-levels in England and I got admission into University of Lagos. Before uh, I finished A-levels, I had to make another choice, stay in England or come back uh, to University of Lagos where I got admission for architecture. Again, I thought my father at that time would make that choice, but no, he told him, it's your choice, it's your decision. You make the choice because you would leave the consequence of that choice. You can't come back and start blaming anybody. So that aspect of uh, growing up was something that I appreciated in life, that you don't blame anybody for the decisions you take. You make those decisions and you leave the consequence thereafter. So you have to think very carefully before you make your choice. Out of the world kind of organization that you helped to program. What was the vision for doing that? How did it all start? And looking at where it are today, where you started, it's a long one, but we're ready. 
you know, it, it, when, when I think about this journey and the questions that come up uh, 20 years later, uh, 25 years later, it's almost as if uh, people expect that you'd have sat down, you had this plan that you're going to become a global uh, business and all of that. But at 26, 27, uh, basically as a result of falling out of a place where one day you had no job, uh, you had a job and the next day you had no job and that's where the story really starts that i had come into uh, the uh, employee employed world right uh, from architecture not wanting to work for anybody <clears throat> my whole plan then was to set up the business uh, a business in architecture to be the biggest architect the world had ever had that was the dream you know and all of a sudden i found myself working uh for five years which was something that my father and i had talked about which i said he didn't know he didn't know what he was talking about at the time but he was of the opinion that if you're going to start your own business any business at all it's better that you work for somebody for at least five years to get some understanding because business or entrepreneurship is not easy learn the ropes i kind of waved him aside that no you don't know what you're talking about but long story short i ended up doing that now when sahara came about it came about as a result of uh, was it june 12 yeah june 12 riots had come in uh, nigeria the company I'd work, i was working for had left if my current partner uh Tokyo Shunubi, used to come to my office where i was working in this brazilian firm and he used to tell me about uh coming to let's set up this business in the oil sector that that is where it's meant to be and all of that i used to ignore him but then with no job and uh a future that one and a son and a son and a daughter and a future that one had to think about sahara became a reality so we sat down and decided that this niche business in this oil sector where it's only run by foreign uh, companies and they keep saying that Nigerians cannot do it and they keep saying that it's a loss making business but you had only foreign companies coming and working in there that there must be something there and I think the vision was that we needed to just make sure that Niger that we enter into a place where they say Nigerians cannot do it and just prove that Nigerians can do it and that's really where it started. So look at when you started and where you are now through that journey, can you take us through that journey? What is it about the organization that makes you say, thank God that we made this collective decision today? I think, I think that at the beginning, one thing was very clear. The bridges were burnt. We could not afford, there was nowhere to go. You couldn't turn back. <clears throat> you couldn't say that, you know what, let me just test this one and try this one. And if it does not work, I will go to do, do this job or something. We didn't have that option. Uh, the, the only option was to focus on this and make it work. And some decisions uh, that we took earlier on in life uh, ended up paying much, uh, much later. So one of the first decisions was that the business was the brand so put the business first and not the individuals so for the first probably five years or six years no one knew who was behind sahara they did not know that it was three of us as far as they were concerned they said it belonged to everybody under the sun except three three of us they looked at small boys who are you because we're pushing a brand and as far as they were concerned this brand cannot be it's not possible to have a brand like this without some big person being behind it uh, some assumed that my father was the one behind it. my father did not even know what I was doing for the first three years of that business he had no idea uh, some felt that I think that was about the time they first said that um, was it which military I've heard all sorts you know so as far as they were concerned, somebody was always behind this company. But the first thing was that build the brand. As far as we always remembered, once, uh, once people who are bigger than their brand pass on, the brand dies with them. And we had seen this over and over with Nigerian entre entrepreneurs of, or, or, or industrialists, as they were called back then. And you will see they will die. And that would be the end of the business. And we said, no, it shouldn't be. We should be able to create a brand that would outlive us. And it's not important to know who the brand, who the individual is behind the brand. Because most of the big companies in the world that you know today, whether it's Coca-Cola, Pfizer, all of them, you have no idea who formed them, who set them up. But you are confident about the brand. So that's one thing that we focused on, brand. We focus also a lot on integrity. We knew that integrity will last through time. That whole hurry about let us make money fast, let's make money fast and make it anyhow would always end you in trouble. 
And so from an early, early day, we decided that money was not going to be the primary issue. Indeed, we did not earn a salary for nearly the first two and a half, three years of the business. Everything went back into the business, so we were very disciplined about money. Integrity was extremely important, so we never said we could do anything that we couldn't do. And even till today, if we say we're going to do something, then be sure that we'll deliver. If we say we cannot do it, we're not going to do it. So integrity became very important. And lastly, relationships. We started building relationships very early and maintained those relationships all the way till, uh, till date. So those three have been a fulcrum for how the business is. Why do you decide to leave an organization as amazing dignifying as that to go into politics, what informed your choice? Because I had friends who were asking me, Ken, why is your brother going into this line of, why is he doing it? I want you to answer that question. You know, uh, Kevin, there are two things that you come uh, face to face with in life. Uh, the first is human beings. Can you help human beings? How much can you help? And the other is government. How ubiquitous it is in everything. Those are two things. So as a business person, when we began to do uh, grow bigger, we were always doing philanthropy. I became the one who generally ran the Sahara Foundation. Um, I would see all sorts of people who were trying to influence and impact and all of that. And we just found out that no matter what you were doing, it was this small. You could not reach as many people you could not do as much because there was something called government in politics that had policies that affected everybody. And if the policies were wrong, then the people would suffer. If the policies could not push the, the idea uh, that would help the, even the businesses, then they would suffer. So that was the first aspect of it. I would be in part of, uh, part of the African Philanthropy Forum. We would be, I would travel, I would see philanthropy. Beautiful. I mean, it's for philanthropy, it really touches the heart. But you always see that behind all the philanthropy, what makes philanthropy necessary almost often is the failure of government to do what it needs to do. And so it became a problem for me, it really became a challenge. So we now began to think that, okay, you know what, we had abandoned, all of us had abandoned politics when we were in our early 20s to set up business, and we did great, no doubt about it. But the more we uh, grew in business, we found out that politics affected everything that we were doing. Decisions that governments would take, decisions of policymakers, politicians, they affected us big time. So we first said that, can we influence politics by being, can big business influence politics? Because you, you are almost in the same corridors every, every other day. So we thought maybe that was the way to go. But you found out that no matter what, unless you were inside, you cannot make the difference. And so we had to make a decision. Do we continue to sit down and moan and we know that you can be better? Or do you go in and make a difference from the inside? So I decided to go in and make a difference from the inside. So let's talk about going in and making a difference from inside. You went to how many local governments, the entire <laughs> local governments in your What was that process like? You're somebody who mixes well with people, high, low, mighty, and all of that. I mean, I know that. But how was that process for you? And what exactly did you do to get to those people, to reach out to them, to tell them what you had in mind? You know, Kevin, so when I got into, as I, as the, first I came into the process when the process was already on. You know, the primaries was coming very soon, very quickly. Uh, there was a lot of a lot of internal uh, battles going on in APC and River State at the time. So the whole place was just charged in a negative way. And I'd said to them that one of the things that we needed to do, and for me, was to go uh, community uh, word by word to all the local governments in every community to see for myself what the people uh, were going through. That I needed to know, I needed to see it firsthand. And most of the politicians said, no, it's not, it's not uh, necessary that, you know, you know, you don't need to do that. You stay in one place, call them, they will come and meet you. And I said, no, you need to go and see what is going on in the uh, backyard of the people that you're going to govern. And that's how I've always done business. Even in business, before I would do something or ask anyone to go and do it, I will make sure that I've gone there, I've tested it, I've seen it, you, you, so that you won't come and tell me something that is not. I would have been there. So I chose to go and look. And Kemi, it was the, both the best experience of my life and the worst. 
The best thing that I came to see people and know a state for what it is across. I love to travel, I love adventure. So that for me wasn't a problem. So I met people, I met some of the greatest people that you would never have seen if you are sitting in the city in the urban center. The worst experience is that it broke my heart. It broke my heart. The amount of the level of poverty and the level of insincerity, the level of um, people just don't care. We have governments that really do not care how their people are. It was sad. Poverty, poverty was just too much. In a state like ours, the level of insecurity and poverty I was seeing, and uh, it was just too bad. People were abandoned, left. There were communities that we went to that had no single presence, no, no uh, state government presence, no federal government presence, none. They could feel nothing. People were just totally abandoned. So, so it was an experience that I would, I'm so glad I did, because it brought me face to face with the reality that if you say that you are a government and you are not there serving the people at their basic, most basic needs, then you failed as a government. There was a particular video I saw where they were shooting. And I remember watching that video and I'm like, he's still talking. <laughs> <laughs> he, is he where he bullet <coughs> I want you to narrate that experience and how were you able to come out of it? And did you experience other experiences like that? Yeah, we, we, we kind of, we, we, we experienced some, some nasty things. But, you know, okay, so uh, first we were doing the, um, what you call the upland areas, which is where the, um, the, you can get to by road. And uh, that incident was the first of the riverine areas where you can only access by water. And um, we, we had always known that the minute you start getting into the water territory and water terrain, uh, that you are moving into a totally different uh, zone. And uh, the chances at that point of militancy and all of that becomes much, much higher. And there, there were a lot, there, people were warning that don't go into the uh, riverine communities because once you start getting into riverine communities, then anything can happen. Nobody can take, uh, can handle your security or vouch for your security anymore. <coughs> but for me, it was important that we did. So that was the very first riverine community that we went to. And what they were trying to do was send a sig signal to say, don't continue. And so they attacked us at the very first place that we went to essentially to say that's the end stop and all of that now i had a choice to make the first choice was do you stop and go back in which case they've won or do you just press on in which case you sh to show that you are determined that the message that you are bringing which is peace and hope will triumph over fear and terror any day and you will triumph it doesn't matter so you may kill one person being me, but that message will continue. And I've been determined already, I've made up my mind a long time ago that this is not something for which fear and death must stop you. The day I decided that I was going in there, <coughs> I was sure, absolutely sure, that my life was at risk. I knew it. So I sat down with my family and, sat down and spoken to them about this whole thing, about going into politics, especially reverse state politics, especially politics in Nigeria, that your life, you're laying it down. So be clear about that. So I was clear about it. So I went in there, <coughs> we had that incident, and I think that incident changed everything. Um, it kind of brought to the fore, a, to the reality of everybody who thought it was a joke before, people who were around me, that we were in very serious business. Secondly, it showed them that I had a determination that we were not going to stop. It did not matter, it did not matter what, we will continue going into every community that this one is not going to stop us. And the very, from that day, from that place, they wanted us to go back into town. I said, no, we're continuing to the next community. And we went to the next community. And in the next community, um, some people with guns were arrested in that community. So they had come again, we saw them, uh, so the police now 
now we're a bit more vigilant about what was happening and we saw people had come into the crowd so they were watching got to their bags and all of that and they were able to find people who had come in there with uh, with guns and they picked them up and that was at the next community on that same day but by the time we did that the day after we continued and went into another community and by now the word had gone around that okay this is a very serious business this they're not going to stop on this and so people started to listen a lot more uh, so in going into the communities, I think what was now clear to them was that if somebody is willing to risk his life to continue on this journey, then it's worth listening to. And so what was used for evil actually turned out to be pretty good. Will you say that if there was um, a synergy <coughs> in the internal warnings of APC that wouldn't give room for you to have the uh, um, issues with the other person who also wanted to be. Do you think it would have helped a lot? I, th I think so. You know, um so uh, there, were, there were many things that we were told uh, in politics and I remember one very senior politician, old politician, had, had advised me a long time ago and he said that um, people like me are, are kept out of politics because we're afraid they make politics look very dirty and we're afraid of soiling our names so as a result of that, we don't come into politics and that it suits the crop of politicians very well. So that if I have that mindset, right, then I'll never go far. So that's the first thing. So that they make it look very dirty. So I need to make sure that if I wanted to go and do politics, that I look beyond the fear, look beyond the issue of dirty politics and just go straight to what you wanted to do. The second aspect of it <coughs> was that people would always say, ah, you need to be a grassroots, you have to be a grassroots, that these grassroots politicians are the ones. And I discovered that what grassroots politics means, right, essentially, is that you pay money to everybody at the grassroots and they will heal you. But you don't care, so you use them. Uh, you don't care what you do for them, as long as you have them on the payroll and you pay them. And I found that to be totally distasteful, because what it means is that you are institutionalizing poverty at a very low level and so for me going into those things to know that you have to look beyond what they say is uh, fear for your reputation and all of that and secondly go and meet the people and understand what they need and see how you can break them out of this circle of poverty and that's for me is exactly what this is about.